Okay, can you still uh, see the slides? Yeah, we can see the slides. Awesome. Um, okay, I guess I will start. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, and today I want to talk about something rainbow and something topological, okay? And this is a joint work with uh, Ron Aharoni and Ron Holzman. And this was, the work uh, was done when I was a uh, postdoc uh, at Technion uh, in Haifa. Um, and, uh, you know, during that period, I think I had a lot of good memory, especially traveling around uh, in the country in Israel and uh, also visited a couple of times Jerusalem and tried to, you know, also visit Bethlehem during that time. So all the good memories comes back. And the reason I, so this is not very recent work. I think, uh, you know, it was done like three years ago, but I think it's a good manual to talk about it since I, perhaps a lot of people in the audience might be interested in, you know, something geometric method or topological method. So you will get a flavor of that in the talk. Um, so, oh, um, by the way, uh, please feel free to interrupt. I saw, you know, on the official website, you know, it's um, the schedule is kind of flexible, I guess, you know, we can go as long as, I don't know, one hour or more if, you know, there are a lot of questions. Um, but I will try to slow down and uh, try to explain um, to you uh, everything I know. Okay. Um, so, First of all, I want to discuss some rainbow phenomena uh, in combinatorics. Um, I guess the most famous one is this uh, problem about transversal in Latin square. Uh, so a Latin square is, you know, uh, n by n table where in each cell you can fill in, uh, you know, one through n, and you can choose one of them so that every uh, row consists of n distinct symbols and every column uh, similarly, you know, n distinct symbols. Um, and here is an example where n is equal to three. Uh, so you can check that every row and column are consists of distinct symbols from one through n, one through one, two, three. Uh, and a transversal is, a selection of cells uh, with, uh, from distinct rows and distinct columns with distinct symbols in them, okay? So I'm going to highlight uh, an example of a transversal. So here one, you know, one, three, two are selected. They are from distinct columns and rows and they have distinct symbols in them. And uh, here is a conjecture, and it's been open for quite a while. Uh, it's called Rice's conjecture. So it asks whether every Latin square of uh, odd order, namely n, when n is odd, uh, has at least one transversal. Uh, and the reason kind of you don't like even order is that, for example, you can easily cook up a two by two uh, Latin square and you would imagine, you know, on the top row, it's one, two, and on the second row, it's two, one. So you don't get to have a transversal, but you can get almost transversal by, you know, but let me not get into that, okay? So, so here's this um, interesting conjecture. Um, and somehow I claim that this is a conjecture that is rainbow, okay? So you actually can see color in the, in this conjecture. Um, so here I drew a complete three by three um, bipartite graph where the edges are three proper, um, are three colored, okay? So I use red, yellow, blue as the colors. And actually, you know, the coloring of this K33 is exactly the same object as the Latin square I drew above. Well, why is that? Um, you know, label the vertices on the left by one, two, three, and the 
the vertex on the right also by one, two, three. So an edge then connects, you know, I on the left and J on the right stands for row uh, entry IJ in the, in the Latin square. And the way we color them is, uh, is consistent with the symbols in the, in the Latin square. So you see that, you know, here I have three entries, one, 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 they are in the entries, you know, column one, one, uh, entry one, one, entry two, two, entry three, three. So, you know, the edges connecting one to one from two to two, from three to three are of the same color. And you do this for the rest of the edges. So you can actually translate this conjecture uh, to something about coloring of graph. Okay, so, so here we have a n by n, you know, complete bipartite graph and the graph, you should think of it as a, you know, this complete bipartite as a way to encode the Latin square. And then we decompose the edges into n perfect matching. So the red matching, yellow matching, blue matching, and they stand for the cells with the same symbols in the Latin square. And all now all we want to do is to find a rainbow perfect matching. Rainbow in the sense that uh, the, uh, the edges in the perfect matching all have uh, different colors. So here, you know, this transversal one, three, two then corresponds to this red edge that connects one to one. And uh, this blue edge that connects uh, two to three and the last yellow edge that connects three to two. Okay. So that's one, you know, one conjecture that is rainbow. Uh, here's another conjecture, um, which on the first side is not rainbow, but we have a rainbow generalization, which was also open. Um, it's a simple question about uh, cycles in a directed graph. So suppose you have a directed graph with n vertices and the minimum out degree is at least n over r. Okay. Take your favorite r, maybe r equals three. And even for that case, the conjecture is open. So suppose you have a graph where the minimum out degree is at least n over three, then your directed graph has a directed cycle of length at, at most r. So if you take r equals three, that just means you have a directed cycle of land, a, a directed triangle in your graph. Okay. So minimum, uh, large minimum degree implies uh, short cycles. Sounds reasonable, right? Um, and, you know, this is a still open question. Um, but I claim that it's still a rainbow problem. Okay, so here's what you do. Um, you take the same graph, but without directing the address. However, you use colors to kind of indicate uh, where, you know, these edges come, uh, come from. So for example, here, if I focus on you know, the vertex on the left, then there are two edges going out. So I colored these two edges with the same color, say here, gray. And you do this for every vertex. You get some coloring of, of, the gra of a graph. Then you want to say that at the end, you will get a rainbow cycle in your graph of small length. Okay. So to reformulate that, um, you have a graph uh, uh, with uh, you know edge color graphs, and then for every color class, you know the size of that edge color class is at least n over r, and you want to show that the graph has a rainbow cycle of length at most r. And the kachata hagvist conjecture is, is a special case of this rainbow generalization in the sense that in kachata hagvist conjecture. Uh, the each color class uh, in G in this rainbow generalization is a star, whereas you know in this rainbow generalization there is no you know constraint on the on each color class. So again, you know this 
problem is also rainbow and uh, um, we don't know how to solve that. So the common theme, as you have seen in the previous two problems is that we are given some set of edges. You know, you should think of each uh, edge set as uh, in some color, right? So you know, the edges in E1 is called the red and the E2, yellow, etc. And we just want to find a rainbow set. Namely, you can pick at most one edge from e each EI and form a new set. And that new set is a rainbow set. And then, you know, you want that rainbow set of edges to satisfy certain conditions. Maybe, you know, it's a cycle, you know, as in the generalization of Kachada hack this, or maybe you want uh, a perfect matching in the case of Latin square. And so here in this talk, I want to focus on matching because matching is just a nice combinatorial uh, optimization problem to think about. Um, some, there are many other reasons to think about it, but um, so in, under this common theme, we are given matchings of you know, several matchings. And at the end, we want to find a rainbow matching. Uh, in other words, you know, I want to find a set of edges that is first a matching and second is a, is, uh, is a rainbow set. Namely, it takes at most one edge from each EI. Um, uh, just to be clear here, I do not demand to take precisely one edge from each EI. So in particular, you know, an empty set, you know, the a matching that consists of no edges is still a rainbow matching. It's just a not so interesting rainbow matching. Okay. So here are several results that we know uh, about uh, rainbow matchings. So for example, here is a theorem by Pokorovsky that says if you have n matchings, so you are given n matchings, any n matchings of size n plus little of n, so you can make precise of this little of n in a bipartite graph, uh, then you are guaranteed to have a rainbow matching of size n. Okay. Here's another result. So if you have n matchings of size n, again, in a bipartite graph, then it's guaranteed that there exists a rainbow matching of size n minus root n. So you can kind of sense the flavor of the problem in the sense that you, know, you are given some matching of certain size, and at the end, you want to somehow demand a large rainbow matching uh, in your graph. Okay, so as you can see, uh, you know, here we really have different ways to play with these parameters, you know, which are in red. And uh, in the first one, the first and the last parameters are the same. And in the second, the first two parameters are the same. So you could imagine to a natural question to ask. So if you want to make the second parameter and the last parameter to be the same, how many matches do you need to guarantee that to happen? So how many matches do you need of size N in a bipartite graph so that you're guaranteed to have a rainbow matching of size N? Okay, so let's think about some examples which tells us a conjectured value or in this, for, to this question. Okay. So here I'm drawing a, an example where n is equal to four. So each matching is of size four, but you could easily generalize it for any n. Uh, so the graph itself is a cycle and you, uh, a cycle of length two n. So here is cycle of length eight, and you can decompose it into two, in two ways into uh, perfect matches. Um, so, you know, here you have the, uh, 
blue matching and also the red matching, each of size four. And you know, in the previous question, we ask, you know, how many matchings do you need to guarantee a rainbow matching? So I'm going to take the same blue matching n minus one times. So in this case, I'm going to, you know, in the n equals four case, I'm going to repeat the blue matchings three times. And then I'm also going to repeat the red matching three times. Okay, so in total, I have now six matchings, you know, three blue matchings and three red matchings. Uh, but you know, if you really want to think about each matching have a different color, then you know, the three blue matchings are just, just have three different shades of blues and the red matchings have three different shades of red, okay? And now uh, I want to pick at most one edge from each matching to get a matching of size four. But you know, in order to get a matching of size four, either you need to get these four edges that are already colored blue or you know, the other four edges that are already colored red. So, but we only have like three copies of red and three copies of blue. So there is not enough edge to form a rainbow matching. Okay. So this example shows us that two N minus two matchings do not guarantee a rainbow matching of size N. So maybe two N minus one suffice and that indeed is the answer. So if you have two N minus one matchings of size N in a bipartite graph, then you are guaranteed to have a rainbow matching of size n. And this 3n minus one uh, is sharp uh, in view of the, you know, this uh, example. And, and the one of the first results in towards answering this question and towards showing this answer is done by Driscoll, but here they, he has a very restrictive uh, constraint on the graph. Namely, you know, instead of have two n minus one matchings, it's really uh, two n minus one matchings in a, an n by n bipartite graph. And in this way, every matching of size n turns out to be a perfect matching because you only have uh, n vertices on the left in your bipartite graph and also n vertices on the right. Okay? Whereas, you know, the full generalization of, you know, of Driscoll's results is that there is no constraint on the size of your bipartite graph. Okay. But here's the, here's what we are going to do. I'm going to, tell you a geometric proof of Driscoll's theorem. And I, then I will try to generalize it. And, and through the way you will see some difficulty in generalizing the geometric proof. And then I will tell you how topology can help you to get over the uh, barrier in the geometric proof. And eventually I will touch on how you know, possibly you can give a proof of, of this more general theorem. Okay. So here's a plan of, uh, of the proof. And at the end, I will talk about some other applications. So, um, okay, so before I move on to, you know, talking about proofs, uh, is there any questions that people want, uh, maybe something want to clarify at this point? Okay, um, then I guess I will um, move on. Um, so here's a geometric proof of Driscoll. Okay, so we start with this beautiful theorem of Baron. Um, so suppose you are given uh, some sets of points 
uh, denoted by P sub K and there are D plus one of them, okay? So you have P1, P2 up to P sub D plus one. And we work in uh, D-dimensional space. So on the left, you see a picture uh, in the plane. So D is two and I have three sets of points. They are colored in different colors. So, you know, red, uh, green, blue, and uh, you notice that um, uh, the gray, this gray point is in the convex hull of every uh, color class. You know, the, the green point is in the red triangle on the blue line, on the green line, okay? And Baron theorem says that if that's the case, then this gray point X also lies in the convex hull of a rainbow set. Okay. In other words, you can pick a red point, a green point, and a blue point so that, uh, so I think in this case, you take this red point and this green point and this blue point and the uh, gray point X is in the convex hull of this rainbow set, okay? So that's Baron's uh, colorful color theodory theorem. Um, and the, there is a cone version of it. Uh, so basically here, instead of have, thinking about convex, convex hall of point sets, we think about the positive cone of um, uh, of a point set. So if you're not familiar with that, so in convex uh, hall, you can take a convex combination of points in the in the point set, right? So you have those, you know, coefficients alpha one, da 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 through alpha n, and they are non-negative, non-negative, and the sum is one. So in the formation of a positive cone you remove the constraint that the sum of those coefficient alphas uh, is equal to one. Okay. So basically you take your point set and you just multiply them with arbitrary non-negative coefficients that add them up. And that's how you form the positive cone. And here um, you know, in the cone version, there is a slightly different. So roughly speaking, you know, the structure of the, of the statement is the same you have this point X that lies in the positive cone and eventually X lies in the positive cone of a rainbow set. But here you don't need D plus one uh, point sets, but rather you only need D um, point sets. Kind of makes sense because you know, the positive cone is just much larger set than the convex hall. So you say you, you, know, you, you have this larger set, hence you save a little in the number of um, point sets that uh, you need to guarantee, uh, you know, uh, to guarantee X to lie in the positive cone of a rainbow set. Okay. Uh, uh, at some point, I will, you know, you will need to use the fact that you know the dimension needs to match with the number of uh, sets in the cone version of Baron's colorful color theory. But we will come back to it. So how does this have, how does this Baron's uh, colorful color theory have anything to do with Driscoll? Well, um, so here's again the statement of Driscoll. You have two n minus one perfect matchings in an n by n bipartite graph, and you want to show there's a rainbow perfect matching. So somehow we want to translate the problem into a problem about points in some Euclidean space, okay? So we are going to take uh, the Euclid 2n dimensional Euclidean space, and we take the standard basis to be u1 through un, v1 through vn. Uh, on the other hand, you should think of u1 through un and v1 through vn as the vertices in my bipartite graph. So U1 through UN are on the left and the V1 through VN are on the right in the bipartite graph, in the N by N bipartite graph. So if I have an edge that connects UI on the, 
on the uh, on the left of my bipartite graph to Vj on the on the right of my bipartite graph, then Ui plus Vj is the corresponding vector that I want to think about in this uh, in this Euclidean space R two n. So you can kind of go in two directions. So you you see an edge in the bipartite graph, then you immediately think about this vector in the two n dimensional Euclidean space. And now suppose we are given these two n minus one perfect matchings of size n. So let's label them by e one e two through e sub two n minus one, and you take any e k. Well, e k is a collection of edges, so you can translate them into vectors in two n dimensional space. Okay, so you have a bunch of vectors, but what can we say about these vectors? Well, we know that e k is a perfect matching, so if I take the sum of all the uh, all these vectors generated by e k, I should see u one through u n and also v one through v n because of this. You know, it's a perfect matching. So, in other words, if I take the sum of all the bases, standard bases in R two n, which I denoted by this one vector, the O one vector then that's in the positive, positive cone of PK that, is, that, that was generated from EK, okay? Well, so that's great. Actually, I see now one vector, you know, one fixed vector, the O1 vector always stays in all the positive cones of the point sets. Well, Baron says then this, vector, you know, this O1 vector is in the cone of a rainbow set. By rainbow set, I mean, I can take some X1 from P1, X2 from P2 and X2 n minus one from P2 n minus one. And that vector is in the positive cone of the that rainbow set formed by X1, X2 up to X2 n minus one. And there is a way to go from here, you know, to interpret this uh, geometric condition back to the edge condition, okay? Uh, and the reason kind of is like in a bipartite graph, if you have a fractional matching of size N, then you can turn it into an integral matching of size N. So somehow there's a way to go back uh, to recover the, the matching from this geometric interpretation. But let me, you know, not dig into detail. So kind of you can reverse the process. Even here, you know, if you do have an O1 vector that is the positive cone of some PK generated by the set EK, then that also tells you that EK itself is already a perfect matching. So here also go back, you obtain a rainbow perfect matching. Okay, so that's roughly the sketch of the proof. You go between the uh, combinatorial graph, you know, bipartite graph, to some vectors in Euclidean space, and you, uh, you know, go back and forth between the two words. So now let me actually, you see that I leave some, left some space here. So I actually want to now tell you that there is a, uh, there is an arrow in this proof as presented here. But the question is, can you see it? Yeah, so I can go back one slide. So again, in the cone version, you really do need d many point sets, a uh, vector uh, point sets to guarantee a rainbow set. And the, the, you know, the number of point sets you need should match the dimension of the ambient space. So if we go back to this proof, unfortunately, we see that the number of 
point sets is just 2n minus 1, whereas the dimension of the ambient space is 2n. So we are one shot uh, in dimension, you know, in the number of point sets. And the fix is that actually all the vectors and all the, you know, this special vector, the all one vector, actually they all live in a one co-dimensional subspace of R2n. Hence, when we restrict ourselves to that one co-dimensional subspace, we do the entire province essentially in an Euclidean space of dimension 2n minus one rather than 2n. Hence, you know, we can apply the, uh, the conversion of Baron's colorful color theodory. Okay. So there's this fix that tells you, you know, actually, you know, the essential dimension that we're, we're working is 2n minus one rather than 2n. And uh, this is a theorem uh, by Aharoni and uh, Ron Aharoni, who I think is in the audience. Uh, hello. Uh, and uh, yeah, ho hope your hands are, uh, are healing well. Uh, and uh, Eddie Berger, uh, who's uh, a faculty at uh, uh, University of Haifa. Um, so they say that actually, you know, in Driscoll theorem, you don't need this constraint um, on the size of the bipartite part. It doesn't have to be an n by n uh, bipartite graph. So, you know, take any bipartite graph and then you have two n minus one matchings of size n, then you are guaranteed to have a rainbow matching of size n. And, you know, it's, it kind of makes sense that, you know, if you remove the constraints that, you know, the bipartite graph is n by n, then problem becomes easier in the following sense, right? So, you know, if your matchings that given 2n minus one matches are completely disjoint, you know, they don't even share vertices, then of course it's easy to find a rainbow matching of size n. You just take one edge from each matching and you are done. Right. So, but that's one extreme. But somehow, you know, if you try to pack all the matchings together into this very crowded n by n bipartite graph, then it's kind of hard to find a rainbow matching uh, of size n because you know these two n minus one matchings just overlap a lot on the vertices. But it's just that in this middle ground where maybe they are not completely disjoint, but also not completely overlapping in vertices with each other, with each other uh, somehow is difficult to deal with. Okay. And one difficulty we can see here is that, you know, suppose I want to mimic the same proof as we did in the previous proof. Well, you will start with some vectors where each you know, u1, u2, et cetera, and v1, v2, et cetera, they represent the vertices in your bipartite graph. But since we have no control on the size of the bipartite graph, we don't even have any control on the dimension of the ambient space. Even we have some tricks to, you know, maybe save one in the dimension of the ambient space. There is completely no control in the dimension of the Euclidean space that we, we would like to work with, right? Whereas, you know, still I only have 2n minus one uh, matchings, hence 2n minus one point sets to work with. So definitely um, Baron's um, colorful color theodory uh, meets some barrier in this problem. Okay, so, well, can we still, you know, try to push uh, through this proof using maybe some generalization of uh, Baron's colorful color theodory theorem. That was the kind of the motivation behind you know, the rest of this topological method. So again, no control on the dimension of ambient space. Okay, so here I want to discuss some topological tools that can help us to um, uh, overcome uh, this barrier. 
So, you know, I will start with some basics. So, you know, a simplicial complex is just a family of sets that is closed undertaking subsets. So it's a closed onward uh, family of sets. So for example, here, the ambient set is one, two, three, four. And I have a collection of subsets of, uh, of V uh, that is closed undertaking subsets. And uh, here you can see you have three vertices, one, two, three, sorry, four vertices, one, two, three, four. And then you have a face, one, two, three, and three, four. So it, basically it's a field triangle with a, a patent edge attached to three. And you can see it's, you know, it's here, you know, you can label this one, two, three, and this is a, this vertex is four. And in general, you can visualize a simplicial complex uh, in this way by drawing simplices. Okay, so let me state uh, kind of a theorem, uh, kind of a generalization of Barron's uh, colorful color theory. This is due to Gil Klein and Roy Mishulam, uh, but it's a special case, you know, the, the version they stated in their paper uses uh, matroid, and uh, I'm just stating their theorem uh, when the matroid is specialized to a partition matroid. So it's kind of easy to see how you know their theorem is related to the rainbow problem. Um, by the way, you know normally whenever you prove some results about rainbow, you know, rainbow sets, then you can also start to think about it, think about generalizing it to something related to matroid, because rainbow is really just um, about, you know, partition matroids in, in some sense. So here you have some subsets of this ambient set V, uh, D plus one, many of them. And then you have a simplicial complex that is D array. I will define D array in a moment, um, but not rigorously. Um, they have some simplicial complex that's nice. And you notice that no, none of these subsets is, a uh, you know, is inside the simplicial complex. So all of them are outside the simplicial complex. Then actually you can find the rainbow set that is also not in the simplicial complex, okay? Uh, so here, you know, definition in air codes. So um, a simplicial complex is D array if uh, C does not have large holes, in particular does not have holes of dimension at least D, okay? uh, whatever it means. Um, okay. So here is a demonstration, or maybe I'm, you know, let me try to convince you that uh, Kalai Mishulam is indeed a generalization of Baron okay? by giving you, you know, kind of a hand-waving proof, a proof sketch. So we want to prove Baron. Well, my ambient space uh, so the ambient set V is just the, you know, all the points that you would like to consider. Okay, the union of all PK, if you want. And then I form this uh, simplicial complex in the following way. So maybe you should actually read the contrapositive of this, uh, this statement. So if X is not in the convex hall of a subset, P of, you know, which is a subset of V, uh, then I put P uh, inside uh, the simplicial complex. Okay. And you can imagine, you know, if a set P does not convex, contain X in the convex hall, then a subset of P also does not contain X in its complex, uh, convex hall. Hence, it's easy, very easy to see that C is close downwards. But you know, here I state the contrapositive is X, if P contains X in the convex hall, then I do not put P in the simplicial complex. 
So, and now the thing is to, you know, Clay Meshulam tells you that if C is delay array, the simplicial complex is delay array, then because every X, every, for every PK, uh, X lies in the convex hole. So I know that every PK is not inside the com simplicial complex. Okay. And the uh, Kalai Mishulam then tells us that there's a rainbow set not in C, but that rainbow set precisely con contains X in the convex hull because of the way we define the simplicial complex. Well, here I'm sorry. Here I'm omitting the proof that uh, you know you need to show that C is a deal array, but that's uh, let me omit that proof. But that's roughly how you you know kind of prove Baron from Klein and Shulam. Can I ask a small question? Uh, yes, please. Oh, so for this, you said that the Klein machine there it somehow involves matrix. Like if you say like, does it? If you say, is it possible to say like specialize to some kind of realizable matrix and then see something like the Bernie theorem, or is it just just using yes, the result itself? I, I'm not aware of that. I okay. think the natural setup to imply Baron is to take the partition matrix rather than some okay. realizable. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, how do you prove? Uh, you know, a complex is deal array, although, you know, I haven't even defined rigorously deal array, but let me attempt to do it. Uh, so the deal array is a concept that, you know, that's used in Kalai Mishulam. On the other hand, in Baron's theorem, uh, in the colorful color theory, we are really dealing with uh, the representables uh, and somehow, you know, if you know a simplicial complex is derepresentable, then that is automatically deal array. Okay. And deal array is indeed a concept that's very topological, uh, whereas derepresentable, although I also haven't defined it uh, and I will not, uh, is a very geometric uh, concept. So somehow, both notions, you know, as we can see that Baron does not quite uh, give uh, the generalization of Driscoll, uh, you know, due to uh, Aharoni and Brigger. Um, so this derepresentable notion might be too, uh, too restrictive for us to use. Whereas this deal array really involves computing some homology group, hom homology group of you know, certain simplicial complex, which doesn't sound quite uh, useful for combinatorial problem. So here's where Wagner uh, came in and said, actually there is an intermediate notion called decollapsibility that sits in between the uh, representable, which is too restrictive and the array, which is too generalized, uh, general uh, to really use. And that notion of decollapsibility is very combinatorial. So that's why, you know, we'd like to use that and uh, show some, you know, have some combinatorial applications. So let me tell you what this decollapsibility is. So by doing, first of all, I'm going to tell you what is an elementary decollapse. So you have your simplicial complex C, and then you pick, uh, you know, normally it's called a face, uh, but just think of it as a, as a, as a set in, in the family, uh, in the simplicial complex C. And also you want the cardinality to be at most D, okay? So you pick some sigma that has small size, And then you need to check that there's a unique maximal face, uh, also known as a face, face set, that contains sigma. So some, some larger, uh, possibly larger uh, set that contains sigma and also it's maximal in C in, under inclusion. 
And then you remove all sets that is between sigma and tau. Okay, and that's called a one element an elementary D collapse. So here is an example. So this is my simplicial complex. As you can see, it has some, um, you know, one dimensional facets and also two two two-dimensional facets. Okay. And I'm going to take this sigma uh, one, two. So it's one of the phase, phases in my simplicial complex. And let's say my D is equal to two. So the size of the size of the uh, the set sigma is at most two, so that checks out. And then the tau is just one, two, four, because that's the unique maximal phase that contains sigma. There is no other phase that contains one, two, that is also maximal. The other you know, phase that has larger dimension is two, three, four, but that doesn't contain one, two. So now you remove everything between one, two, and one, two, four. Well, there's, there are only two, you know, the edge and the face, you remove them. And then later you focus on two, three, and two, three will, you know, has this maximal phase that is unique containing two, three, which is what, two, three, four, and they remo remove, you know, two, three, and the two, three, four, so you get this, and the, you know, and then you can start, uh, you know, collapsing it further, you can take two, four, the maximum phase containing two, four is just itself, remove that, and you can remove the edges gradually. So every time when you select this sigma, we get, you know, as we show here, every time the size of sigma is at most two. So in that case, we say that this complex is too collapsible. So again, you know, you say that a simplicial complex is decollapsible if you can have this chain, this sequence of elementary decollapses that turns your simplicial complex into nothing. Okay. And certainly, you know, if your if you know if the largest set in your complex C is of size D, then you can always decollapse it to nothing, hence it's decollapsable. But here we are really trying to optimize, to minimize this D and this, uh, okay? By the way, so since the example is here, I want to point out, for example, in the first step, it's not okay to take two four as your sigma, because in that case, you both have one, two, four, and the two, three, four that contains two, four as, you know, as a subset. However, this max, the maximal phase containing two, four is not unique. So you cannot do that. So you somehow, you know, here sigma is one, two is a legit, legitimate uh, decollapse, elementary decollapse, but taking two, four is not legitimate, okay? So here's this notion of decollapsible. decollapsible. So applications. Um, oh, by the way, so as you can see, you know, all of um, this decollapsibility is defined combinatorially. Right? Basically, you can play around with you know um, subsets and you remove them. So you know you don't need to calculate um, homology groups. Um, okay, so here I changed Kalimi Shulam slightly. Uh, you know, you still have uh, subsets of the ambient set V, and your simplicial complex is decollapsible. Previously, it's D array, but you know, let's assume that decollapsibility is a more restricted version of D array, okay. and it sits between in between D the representability and uh, the Larinus. So you have a simplicial complex and you know that none of those subsets is in the simplicial complex D, then you can find a rainbow set that is also not in the complex. 
Okay, and uh, you know here again is the um, matching uh, result given by Heronian Berger. So you know here the sketch that you can. No, I will try to convince you that actually Kalei Shulam implies a Heronian Berger. Um, so your ambient set V is just the, the union of all the edge sets, uh, all the matchings. So, so you know you have these two n minus one matchings. You put all of the edges together from this V, and the complex is the follow is as follows. So you put a subset of edges in your, in your complex if the matching number of E is less than N. Okay. So somehow, you know, you, if you have a graph, you can naturally form this uh, complex by collecting sets of edges with matching, small matching numbers. And of course, uh, this, see this collection of edges is a complex because if you take a subset of edges whose matching number is already less than n, then your matching number can only get worse, get smaller. Okay, um, so all you now need to do is to show that the complex is 2n minus 2 collapsible because once that's done, Kalai Mishulam will tell you that there's a rainbow set that is not in C. Uh, oh, by the way, so here, every set EI is not in C. So that somehow helps us with the condition in the Kalai Mishulam. So once you show the collapsibility, then you know, you know that there is a rainbow set that is not in C. Hence, not in C just means the rainbow set has matching number at least N. Okay, so you get a rainbow matching of size at least n. Uh, there is some technical work that goes into proving the 2n minus 2 collapsibility of the complex. So here's a, let me propose a root relative uh, business model. Since you know, you're here, maybe you want to work on some problems. Uh, so pick your favorite graph parameter, you know, in the matching case it's mu, but maybe for some other problems, you have some combinatorial structure and there is a, maybe a parameter associated to the combinatorial structure. And now you take this complex, oh, by the way, the parameter, the combinatorial parameter has to be monotone in the sense that if you take a subset of your combinatorial structure, the parameter does not increase. Okay? So you collect you know, subsets of your combinatorial structure and the demand that the, the, the parameter is not too large. And you show that it's decollapsible. Okay? That requires some work, but suppose that can be done. And apply Kalei Mishulam and voila, you get your rainbow result, namely that you, know, you have this, um, you know, in this case, edges, but you know it can be other things, and the, you know you all of them has large, uh, is large in the graph parameter that you picked, and then you get a rainbow set where the that graph parameter is also large. Okay. So with this idea, we generalize. Um, some result to hypergraphs. So here, you know, we really, you know, think about a different, uh, but a generalization of graphs called hypergraphs. And in there, um, you know, you can talk about apartheid hypergraphs and some edges and the graph parameter we take is called fractional matching number. Okay, so a fractional matching number has this Complicated definition, let me not get into it, but it's a fractional generalization of a match number. So in some way you can formulate match number as an integer programming, but the linear programming relaxation of that gives you the fractional match number, okay? And you know, we can use 
uh, you know, that business model to generate um, the result to upper tie graph, but with the parameter mu matching number uh, replaced by fractional matching numbers. Uh, exactly follows the same, you know, uh, framework or outline of the proof that I just showed you. Uh, okay, uh, so I, I guess, you know, maybe one nice thing to take away is some interesting uh, uh, application of Driscoll theorem. It has, this has nothing to do with uh, anything I talked about today, but I just felt like, you know, I have this obligation to share it because it's very nice application of Driscoll. Um, so what I, so what we will see is that actually Driscoll implies Elder Ginsburg Z, and this is a proof given by uh, Noga Law. So, okay, so, I have, you know, in Elder Ginsburg Ziv, you have 2n minus one numbers in Z mode n, and you want to show that you can actually pick n of them so that the sum is equal to zero mode n. Okay. But how do you see a graph in this number theoretic statement? Well, for every AI, where AI is one of those 2n minus one numbers, you can form a matching by connecting X to X plus AI. So the bipartite graph here um, has two parts. The left part is a copy of Z mod N and also the right part is also Z mod N. So for example, here, if you know the number is zero, then you basically match X to X from left to right. So it's, you know, you see a bunch of parallel lines. In general, you can just add AI to the vertex on the left and then connect it to X plus AI on the right. So you form a matching and you get two and minus one matchings, great. Um, so then you, and it's a perfect matching. Um, and Driscoll tells you that there is a rainbow matching of size N. Okay? In other words, out of these two and minus one perfect matches that we just formed, you can take n of those and each one contributes one edge and they together form a matching, okay? a perfect matching. So in other words, I find an edge from one, you know, on the left to one plus a sub i one. So one of those two n minus one numbers and also two is matched to two plus a i two, et cetera. And all these i one, i two up to i n are distinct because you know, they're rainbow. So they come from different EIs. So rainbow just means you know, the uh, indices are different. But now since it's a perfect matching, I know that you know, the points that are matched on the right sums to one through n, you know, once, you know, it's a permutation of one through n. So in particular, uh, one plus two up to n is equal to one plus a i one plus da, 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 plus n plus, you know, a i n, but you just cancel out all the one, two, three up to n on both sides. And that gives you that the sum of those, you know, a i one and a i two, a i n is equal to zero hence showing the Eldish uh, Ginsburg Ziv theorem. Okay. It's a pretty neat uh, application of Driscoll. Uh, so now we are towards the end of the talk. Um, one open problem. Um, so the motivation is to remove the bipartiteness in the in Aharoni Berger uh, theorem. And uh, even before that, let's look at an example. So here was the old example that I showed you at the beginning of, towards the beginning of the talk. Namely, you have a cycle and you decompose it into you know, two matchings and you repeat each matching proper number of times. So here, you know, red is repeated three times. Think of them as 
you know, three different kinds, uh, shades of red and uh, three blue matches. And then I add one more matching uh, in green. Okay, so in total, I have seven matchings. Uh, notice that, that right now my graph is not bipartite. Okay, so that doesn't serve as a counterexample to the, to the, in the previous setup. But here I'm, you know, removing the bipartiteness in the, in the problem. And somehow you can see that there is no rainbow matching of size uh, four. Okay, and the, you can generalize this uh, uh, construction for, for larger number of vertices. Okay. So the conjecture actually is that, so previously here, you know, we need QM minus one, but the conjecture is that now, if you remove the bipartiteness of the graph, you no longer restrict to the bipartite graph, you only need one more matching uh, to guarantee a rainbow matching of size n. Okay. And uh, in this direction, uh, we have a work of Aharoni, Berger, Trunovsky, Howard, and Seymour that says 3n minus 2 matching suffice. And uh, it was later followed with a, with a work by Aharoni and I think the Kims, uh, you know, who were postdoc at Technia, that knocks off a further one from this. So uh, 3n minus 3, I think, is the current record, but there is still a long way to go from 3n, 3n minus 3 to 2n. Okay. And uh, with this conjecture, that concludes my talk. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much for that nice talk. Are there any questions? That does not seem to be the case. In that case, thanks again.